we've just released our latest ISA briefing on urbanization trends and migration in the U.S. I'm here with Rich Kleinman and Jen Wickman. Uh, Jen, there's been a lot of talk about the rebirth of cities and that's how that's kind of turned into the rise of suburbs. What's the reality behind this narrative and, and what are the drivers behind that? Yeah, so this shift uh, has gotten a lot of attention since the pandemic, but it was actually underway at the end of the last decade. Uh, and that's really driven by the millennial generation. That's a, a very large demographic cohort here in the US. And after the global financial crisis, that cohort was largely in their 20s and really living in urban areas and drove a lot of the demand that we saw for urban apartments during that period. But towards the middle or the end of the last decade, that demographic uh, cohort started to age into their family years. The oldest members started their families, wanted more space, and wanted to, to take advantage of better schools that are available out in the suburbs. So they started to move out of the city uh, and into the suburbs. And during that time period, we also saw a pretty big shift toward the Sun Belt. Uh, the migration to that area was really strong throughout the last decade. And people really started to slow down um, their migration into the bigger northern gateway cities. And really, the Sun Belt offered a more affordable option for home ownership, and it had better weather than in, up in the north. And so during when the pandemic hit, those trends really accelerated because people had more flexibility with working from home. They needed more space. They could try out living in a new city. And so we just saw people moving out of the city altogether. Uh, when the pandemic did start to ease, we saw people come back to the city. A lot of those young people in particular wanted to take advantage of the lifestyle that you can live in an urban area. But uh, going forward, we do expect to see that rise of the suburbs narrative is going to take hold as the, the rest of the millennial generation starts their families and wants to move out into the suburbs and maybe to the south of the, to the Sun Belt to take advantage of those more affordable living options. So uh, what does that mean for investment strategy, Rich? How do we take that into account? Yeah, you know, the thing I would say first is that, you know, these kinds of real estate investment strategy decisions are, they're never all or nothing calls. It's not, I only want to do the suburbs, I only want to do urban places. Um, there's always a balance. And the other thing is that as investors, we're building real estate portfolios for a, with a long-term view. So these trends that Jen spoke about, they're things we need to be mindful of in terms of how we're tilting strategies, but they're not all or nothing things to follow. So as Jen noted, you know, in the early part of the last decade, as millennials were in urban places, that's where we started tilting our portfolios. Then towards the middle of that decade, when trends started to go the other way, we started tilting in the other direction. But you know, what I would say in terms of how I think about um, transaction decisions and asset selection decisions is that you kind of have to raise the bar for the place where the tailwinds are a little bit less and maybe lower the bar a bit when you have more of those strong demographic tailwinds and migration tailwinds that Jen was talking about. And we, we've been talking entirely about the U.S. here. Um, do these same kinds of themes apply to other parts of the world, Rich? Well, you know, what I've seen is that every part of the world is a bit different in terms of how land use has evolved and what that implies for these kinds of urban and regional trends. Um, you know, even to the point that we see different terminology in different places speaking the same language. So, you know, I really don't like to extrapolate too much from what I think is maybe a relatively unique U.S. story to other parts of the world. And it's not to say the U.S. is only place that unique. I think every place is unique in their own way. Jen talked about climate migration. I don't know of another developed market that has such a wide spread between north and south climates that leads to such significant climate migration. And Jen mentioned schools, you know, the system for school funding in the U.S. is unique, just as it is in every other place. And that contributes to these trends with a different school system. You might see different migration trends follow from demographics. Right. So, you know, the, the, you know, the very definition of city and suburb varies between markets, let alone all of the realities on the ground. Um, you know, we, we at LaSalle have had this DTU plus E framework for thinking about how big secular trends are impacting uh, real estate and, and, and strategy, demographics, technology, urbanization, and environmental factors. And, you know, realizing that urbanization is not a one-way street, you know, migration to cities sometimes reverses for all the reasons that we, we discussed. I think it's probably better to think of that U, urbanization, as urban and regional change because there's flows you know, between cities, there's flows within cities, and it's not, it doesn't go in one direction. So 
we, you know, we're going to stick with that DTU plus E framework, but make sure we're clear about how we, how, what we mean by urbanization, because it's, there's some complex patterns involved. If you want to learn more about this, please read the note that uh, Rich and Jen wrote, and you can find that on the insight section of the cell.com.